The Story of Civilization, Volume 2, The Life of Greece, Part 2, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 8, Side 1. Egyptian tradition combined with Greek law to build up a system of legislation which borrowed from and improved upon the Athenian code in every respect except freedom. The edicts of the king had full legal force, but the cities enjoyed considerable self-government, and the Egyptian, Greek, and Jewish population lived each under its own system of law, chose its own magistrates, and pled before its own courts. A tour in papyrus gives us the record of an Alexandrian lawsuit. The issues are precisely defined, the evidence is carefully presented, precedents are summarized, and the final judgment is given with judicial impartiality. Other papyri preserve Alexandrian wills and reveal the antiquity of legal forms. This is the will of Piscius the Lycian, son of X, of sound mind and deliberate intention. The Ptolemaic was the most efficiently organized government in the Hellenistic world. It took its national form from Egypt and Persia, its municipal form from Greece, and passed them on to imperial Rome. The country was divided into gnomes or provinces, each administered by appointees of the king. Nearly all these officials were Greek. The idea of Alexander, that Greek and Oriental or Egyptian should live and mingle on equal terms, was forgotten as unlucrative. The valley of the Nile became frankly a conquered land. The Greek overseers brought an advanced technology and management to the economic life of Egypt and enormously expanded the wealth of the nation, but they took the increase. The state charged high prices for the products which it controlled and barred competition with a tariff wall. Hence, olive oil that cost 21 drachmas in Delos cost 52 in Alexandria. Everywhere the government took rentals, taxes, customs, and tolls, sometimes labor and life itself. The peasant paid a fee to the state for the right to keep cattle, for the fodder that he fed them, and for the privilege of grazing them on the common pasture land. The private owner of gardens, vineyards, or orchards paid a sixth, under Ptolemy II, a half of his produce to the state. All persons except soldiers, priests, and government officials paid a poll tax. There were taxes on salt, legal documents, and bequests, a 5% tax on rentals, a 10% tax on sales, a 25% levy on all fish caught in Egyptian waters, a toll on goods passing from village to town or along the Nile. There were high ex export as well as import duties at all Egyptian ports. There were special taxes to maintain the fleet and the lighthouse, to keep the municipal physicians and police in good humor, and to buy a gold crown for every new king. Nothing was overlooked that could fatten the state. To keep track of all taxable products, income, and transactions, the government maintained a swarm of scribes and a vast system of personal and property registration. To collect the taxes, it farmed them out to specialists, supervised their operations, and held their possessions as security till the returns were in. The total revenue of the Ptolemies in money and kind was probably the greatest gathered by any government between the fall of Persia and the ascendancy of Rome. 3. Alexandria Most of this wealth came to Alexandria. The Nome capitals and a few other towns were also prosperous, with paved and lighted streets, police protection, and a good water supply. But nothing quite so modern as Alexandria had ever been seen before. Strabo describes it in the first century A.D. as over three miles long and a mile wide. Pliny reckons the city wall as fifteen miles in length. Dinocrates of Rhodes and Sostratus of Nidus laid out the city on the rectangular plan, with a central avenue one hundred feet wide running from east to west, crossed by an equally wide avenue from north to south. Each of these thoroughfares, and probably some others, was well lighted at night and was kept cool during the day by mile after mile of shaded colonnades. Of the four quarters into which the main arteries divided the city, the westernmost, Rakotis, was occupied chiefly by Egyptians. The northeast portion formed the Jewish quarter. The southeast corner, or Bruchium, contained the royal palace, the museum, the library, the tombs of the Ptolemies, the sarcophagus of Alexander, the Hôtel des Invalides of the Age, the arsenal, the chief Greek temples, and many spacious parks. One park had a portico 600 feet in length. Another contained the royal zoological collection. In the center of the city were the administrative buildings, the government storehouses, the courthouse, the main gymnasium, and a thousand shops and bazaars. Outside the gates were a stadium, a hippodrome or racetrack, an amphitheater, and a vast cemetery known as the Necropolis or City of the Dead. Along the beach ran a succession of bathing establishments and resorts. A dike or mole 
called Heptastadium because it was seven stadia long, connected the city with the island of Pharos and made two harbors out of one. Behind the city lay Lake Mariatus, which provided ports and outlets for the traffic on the Nile. Here the Ptolemies kept their pleasure boats and took their royal ease. Hardly anything but a few catacombs and pillars have been preserved from ancient Alexandria. Its remains lie directly under the present capital, making excavation expensive. Probably they have sunk beneath the water level, and parts of the old city have been covered by the Mediterranean. The population of Alexandria about 200 B.C. was as varied as in a modern metropolis. From four to five hundred thousand Macedonians, Greeks, Egyptians, Jews, Persians, Anatolians, Syrians, Arabs, and Negroes. The growth of commerce had swelled the lower middle class and filled the cosmopolitan capital with a busy, talkative, litigious crowd of shopkeepers and traders, always on the alert for a bargain and with no prejudice in favor of honesty. At the top were the Macedonians and the Greeks, living in such luxury as astonished the Roman ambassadors who were appointed to the court in 273. Athenaeus recounts the delicacies that burdened the tables and digestions of the master class, and Herodotus writes, Alexandria is the house of Aphrodite, and everything is to be found there. Wealth, playgrounds, a large army, a serene sky, public displays, philosophers, precious metals, fine young men, a good royal house, an academy of science, exquisite wines, and beautiful women. Alexandria's poets were discovering the literary value of virginity, and its novelists would soon make it the theme and final casualty of many a tale. But the city was notorious for the generosity of its women and the number of its stepdaughters of joy. Polybius complained that the finest private homes in Alexandria belonged to the courtesans. Women of all classes moved freely through the streets, shopped in the stores, and mingled with the men. Some of them made a name for themselves in literature and scholarship. The Macedonian queens and ladies of the court, from Ptolemy II's Arsinoe to Antony's Cleopatra, took an active part in politics and served policy rather than love with their crimes. But they retained sufficient charm to arouse the men to unprecedented gallantry, at least in poetry and prose, and brought into Alexandrian society an element of feminine influence and grace unknown in classic Greece. Probably a fifth of Alexandria's population was Jewish. As far back as the 7th century, there had been Hebrew settlements in Egypt. Many Jewish traders had entered in the wake of the Persian conquest. Alexander had urged Jews to emigrate to Alexandria and had, according to Josephus, offered them equal political and economic rights with the Greeks. Ptolemy I, after taking Jerusalem, carried with him into Egypt thousands of Jewish captives who were freed by his successor. At the same time, he invited well-to-do Hebrews to establish their homes and businesses in Alexandria. By the beginning of the Christian era, there were a million Jews in Egypt. A large number of these lived in the Jewish quarter of the capital. It was no ghetto, for the Jews were free to live in any quarter but the Bruchium, which was restricted to official families and their servitors. They chose their own Gerusia, or Senate, and followed their own worship. In 169, the high priest Onias III built a great temple at Leontopolis, a suburb of Alexandria, and Ptolemy VI, his personal friend, assigned the revenues of Heliopolis for its maintenance. Such temples served as schools and meeting places, as well as for religious services. Hence they were called by the Greek-speaking Jews, synagogi, that is, places of assembly. Since few Egyptian Jews after the second or third generation in Egypt knew Hebrew, the reading of the law was followed by an interpretation in Greek. Out of these explanations and applications rose the custom of preaching a sermon on a text, and out of the ritual came the first forms of the Catholic Mass. This religious and racial separation combined with economic rivalries to arouse, towards the end of this period, an anti-Semitic movement in Alexandria. The Greeks and Egyptians alike were habituated to the union of church and state and frowned upon the cultural independence of the Jews. Furthermore, they felt the competition of the Jewish artisan or businessman and resented his, his energy, tenacity, and skill. When Rome began to import Egyptian grain, it was the Jewish merchants of Alexandria who carried the cargoes in their fleets. The Greeks, perceiving their failure to Hellenize the Jews, feared for their own future in a state where the majority remained persistently oriental and bred so vigorously. Forgetting the legislation of Pericles, they complained that the Jewish law forbade mixed marriages and that the Jews for the most part kept to themselves. Anti-Semitic literature multiplied. Manetho, an Egyptian historian, gave currency to the story that the Jews had been expelled from Egypt centuries back because they had been afflicted with scrofula or leprosy. 
Feeling mounted on both sides until, in the first century of the Christian era, it broke out into destructive violence. The Jews did what they could to allay the resentment against their amixia, their social separation, and their success. Though they clung to their religion, they spoke Greek, studied and wrote about Greek literature, and translated their sacred books and their histories into Greek. To acquaint the Greeks with the Jewish religious tradition, and to enable the Jew who knew no Hebrew to read his own scriptures, a group of Alexandrian Jewish scholars began, probably under Ptolemy II, a Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. The kings favored the undertaking in the hope that it would make the Jews of Egypt more independent of Jerusalem and would lessen the flow of Jewish-Egyptian funds to Palestine. Legend told how Ptolemy Philadelphus, at the suggestion of Demetrius of Philirum, had invited some seventy Jewish scholars to come from Judea, about two-fifty, to translate the scriptures of their people, how the king had lodged each of them in a separate room on Pharos, and had kept them without intercommunication until each had made his own rendering of the Pentateuch how all the seventy versions, when finished, agreed word for word, proving the divine inspiration of the text and of the translators, how the king rewarded the scholars with costly presents of gold, and how from these circumstances the Greek version of the Hebrew Bible came to be known as the Hermonia Catatus Hebdomacanta, the interpretation according to the seventy, in Latin, Interpretatio Septuaginta, in a word, the Septuagint. Whatever the process of translation, the Pentateuch seems to have appeared in Greek before the close of the third century, and the prophetic books in the second. This was the Bible used by Philo and St. Paul. The process of Hellenization in Egypt failed as completely with the natives as with the Jews. Outside of Alexandria, the Egyptians sullenly maintained their own religion, their own dress or nudity, their own immemorial ways. The Greeks thought of themselves as conquerors, not as fellow men. They did not bother to build Greek cities south of the delta or to learn the language of the people, and their laws did not recognize the marriage of an Egyptian with a Greek. Ptolemy I tried to unite the Greek and native faiths by identifying Serapis and Zeus. Later Ptolemies encouraged the cult of themselves as gods to offer a common and convenient object of worship to their heterogeneous population. But those Egyptians who were not courting office paid little attention to these artificial cults. The Egyptian priests, shorn of their wealth and power and dependent for their sustenance upon grants of money from the state, waited patiently for the Greek wave to recede. In the end, it was not Hellenism that won in Alexandria, but mysticism. Now were laid the foundations of Neoplatonism and the medley of promissory cults that competed for the Alexandrian soul in the centuries that surrounded the birth of Christ. Osiris as Serapis became the favorite god of the later Egyptians and of many Egyptian Greeks. Isis regained popularity as the goddess of women and motherhood. When Christianity came, neither the clergy nor the people found it impossible to change Isis into Mary and Serapis into Christ. 4. Revolt The lesson of Ptolemaic socialism is that even a government may exploit. Under the first two Ptolemies, the system worked reasonably well. Great engineering enterprises were completed, agriculture was improved, Marketing was brought into order, the overseers behaved with a modest measure of injustice and partiality, and though the exploitation of materials and men was thorough, its profits went in large degree to develop and adorn the country and to finance its cultural life. Three factors ruined the experiment. The Ptolemies went to war and spent more and more of the people's earnings upon armies, navies, and campaigns. After Philadelphus, there was a rapid deterioration in the quality of the king. They ate and drank and mated and allowed the administration of the system to fall into the hands of rascals who ground every possible penny out of the poor. The fact that the exploiters were foreigners was never forgotten by the Egyptians nor by the priests who dreamed of the flesh pots of Egypt that their class had enjoyed before the Persian and Greek domination. The Ptolemaic conception of socialism was essentially one of intensified production rather than a wide distribution. The fellow received enough of his product to keep him alive but not enough to encourage him in his work or in the business of rearing a family. Generation after generation, the government's exactions grew. The system of detailed national control became intolerable, like the relentlessly watchful eye of a despotic parent. The state lent seed corn to the peasant to plant his crop and then bound him to the farm until the harvest was in. No peasant might use any of his own product until all his debts had been paid to the state. The fellow was patient, but even he began to grumble. By the second century, a substantial part of the soil had been abandoned for lack of peasants to work it. The clerics or lessees of royal land could get no tenants to till it for them. They tried to do it themselves, but were not up to the task. Gradually, the desert crept back upon civilization. 
In the gold mines of Nubia, the slaves worked naked in dark and narrow galleries, in cramping positions, loaded with chains and encouraged by the whip of the overseer. Their food was poor, not even enough to keep them alive. Thousands of them succumbed from malnutrition and fatigue, and the only welcome event in their lives was death. The common laborer in the factories received one obol, or nine cents a day, the skilled worker two or three. Every tenth day was a day of rest. Complaints multiplied and strikes grew more frequent. Strikes among the miners, the quarrymen, the boatmen, the peasants, the artisans, the tradesmen, even the overseers and the police. Strikes seldom for better pay, since the toilers had ceased to hope for this, but of simple exhaustion and despair. We are worn out, says a papyrus record of one strike. We will run away, that is, seek sanctuary in a temple. Nearly all the exploiters were Greeks, nearly all the exploited were Egyptians or Jews. The priests clandestinely appealed to the religious feelings of the natives, while the Greeks resented any concession made to Jews or Egyptians by the government. In the capital, the populace was bribed by state bounties and spectacles, but it was excluded from the royal quarter, was watched by a large military force, and was allowed no voice in national affairs. In the end, it became an irresponsible and violent mob. In 216, the Egyptians revolted but were put down. In 189, they revolted again, and the mutiny continued for five years. The Ptolemies won for a time by the force of their army and by raising their contributions to the priests, but the situation had become impossible. The country had been milked to depletion, and even the exploiters felt that nothing remained. Disintegration set in on every side. The Ptolemies passed from natural to unnatural vice, from intelligence to stupidity. They married with a freedom and haste that forfeited the esteem of their people. Luxury unfitted them for war or government, at last even for thought. Lawlessness and dishonesty, incompetence and hopelessness, the absence of competition and of the stimulus that comes from ownership, lowered year by year the productivity of the land. Literature waned, creative art died. After the third century, Alexandria added little to either. The Egyptians lost respect for the Greeks, and the Greeks, if such a thing can be believed, lost respect for themselves. Year by year they forgot their own language and spoke a corrupt mixture of Greek and Egyptian. More and more of them married their sisters after native custom, or married into Egyptian families and were absorbed. Thousands of them worshipped Egyptian gods. By the second century the Greeks had ceased to be the dominant race even politically. The Ptolemies, to preserve their authority, had adopted the Egyptian faith and ritual, and had increased the power of the priests. As the kings sank into Epicurean ease, the clergy reasserted its leadership and won back year by year the lands and privileges which the earlier Ptolemies had taken away. The Rosetta Stone, dated 196 BC, describes the coronation ceremonies of Ptolemy V as following almost completely the Egyptian forms. Under Ptolemy V, from 203 to 181, and Ptolemy VI, from 181 to 145, dynastic feuds absorbed the energies of the royal house while Egyptian agriculture and industry decayed. Order and peace were not restored until Caesar, as a mere incident in his career, took Egypt with hardly a blow, and Augustus made it a province of Rome in 30 B.C. 5. Sunset in Sicily The Hellenistic age faced east and south and almost ignored the west. Cyrene prospered as usual, having learned that it is better to trade than to war. Out of it in this period came Callimachus the poet at Eratosthenes the philosopher, and Carneades the philosopher. Greek Italy was worried and weakened by the double challenge of multiplying natives and rising Rome, while Sicily lived in daily fear of the Carthaginian power. Twenty-three years after the coming of Timoleon, a rich man's revolution suppressed the Syracusan democracy and put the government into the hands of six hundred oligarchic families, this in 320. These divided into factions and were in turn overthrown by a radical revolution in which 4,000 persons were killed and 6,000 of the well-to-do were sent into banishment. Agathocles won dictatorship by promising a cancellation of debts and a redistribution of the land. So periodically the concentration of wealth becomes extreme and gets righted by taxation or by revolution. After 47 years of chaos, during which the Carthaginians repeatedly invaded the island and Pyrrhus came, won, lost, and went, Syracuse, by unmerited good fortune, fell into the power of Hiram II, the most beneficent of the many dictators thrown up by the passions and turbulence of the Sicilian Greeks. Hiram ruled for fifty-four years, says the astonished Polybius, without killing, exiling, or injuring a single citizen, which indeed is the most remarkable of all things. 
Surrounded by all the means of luxury, he led a modest and temperate life and lived to the age of ninety. On several occasions he wished to resign his authority, but the people begged him to retain it. He had the good judgment to make an alliance with Rome, and thereby kept the Carthaginians at bay for half a century. He gave the city order and peace and considerable freedom. He executed great public works, and without oppressive taxation left a full treasury at his death. Under his protection or patronage, Archimedes brought ancient science to its culmination, and Theocritus sang in the last perfect Greek the loveliness of Sicily and the expected bounty of its king. Syracuse became now the most populous and prosperous city in Hellas. Hiron amused his leisure by watching his artisans, under the supervision of Archimedes, construct for him a pleasure boat that embodied all the shipbuilding art and science of antiquity. It was half a stadium, or 407 feet in length. It had a sport deck with a gymnasium and a large marble bath, and a shaded garden deck with a great variety of plants. It was manned by 600 seamen in 20 groups of oars, and could carry in addition 300 passengers or marines. It had 60 cabins, some with mosaic floors, and doors of ivory and precious woods. It was elegantly furnished in every part, and was adorned with paintings and statuary. It was protected against attack by armor and turrets, from each of the eight turrets great beams extended with a hole at the end through which large stones could be dropped upon enemy vessels. Throughout its length Archimedes constructed a great catapult capable of hurling stones of three talents weight, or 174 pounds, or arrows twelve cubits or eighteen feet long. It could carry 3,900 tons of cargo and itself weighed a thousand tons. Hiron had hoped to use it in regular service between Syracuse and Alexandria, but finding it too large for his own docks, and extravagantly expensive to maintain, he filled it with corn and fish from Sicily's abounding fields and seas, and sent it, vessels and contents, as a gift to Egypt, which was suffering an unusual dearth of corn. Hiron died in 216. He had wished to establish a democratic constitution before his death, but his daughters prevailed upon his dotage to bequeath his power to his grandson. Hieronymus turned out to be a weakling and a scoundrel. He abandoned the Roman alliance, received envoys from Carthage, and permitted them to become in effect the rulers of Syracuse. Rome, not abounding in corn, prepared to fight Carthage for the wealth of an island that had never learned to govern itself. All the Mediterranean world, like a decaying fruit, prepared to fall into the hands of a greater and more ruthless conqueror than Greek history had ever known. Chapter 26 Books 1. Libraries and Scholars In every field of Hellenistic life except the drama, we find the same phenomenon. Greek civilization not destroyed, but dispersed. Athens was dying, and the Greek settlements of the West, barring Syracuse, were in decay. But the Greek cities of Egypt and the East were at their material and cultural zenith. Polybius, a man of wide experience, historical knowledge, and careful judgment, spoke about 148 B.C. of the present day when the progress of the arts and sciences has been so rapid. The words have a familiar ring. Through the dissemination of Greek as a common tongue, a cultural unity was now established which would last in the eastern Mediterranean for nearly a thousand years. All men of education in the new empires learned Greek as the medium of diplomacy, literature, and science. A book written in Greek could be understood by almost any educated non-Greek in Egypt or the Near East. Men spoke of the oikumene, or inhabited world, as one civilization, and developed a cosmopolitan outlook less stimulating but perhaps more sensible than the proud and narrow nationalism of the city-state. For this enlarged audience, thousands of writers wrote hundreds of thousands of books, we know the names of 1,100 Hellenistic authors. The unknown are an incalculable multitude. A cursive script had developed to facilitate writing. Indeed, as early as the 4th century B.C., we hear of systems of shorthand whereby certain vowels and consonants can be expressed by strokes placed in various positions. Books were written on Egyptian papyrus until Ptolemy VI, hoping to check the growth of the library at Pergamum, forbade the export of the material from Egypt. Eumenes II countered by encouraging the mass production of the treated skins of sheep and calves, which had long been used for writing purposes in the East, and soon parchment from the city and the name of Pergamum rivaled paper as a vehicle of communication and literature. Books having grown to such numbers, libraries became a necessity. These had existed before as the luxury of Egyptian or Mesopotamian potentates, but apparently Aristotle's library was the first extensive private collection. We may conjecture its size and worth from the fact that he paid $18,000 for that part of it which he bought from Plato's successor, Spusippus. 
Aristotle bequeathed his books to Theophrastus, who bequeathed them in 287 to Neleus, who took them to Sepsis in Asia Minor, where they were buried, says tradition, to escape the literary cupidity of the Pergamene kings. After almost a century of this damaging interment, the volumes were sold about 100 B.C. to a pelican of Teos, an Athenian philosopher. A pelican found that many passages had been eaten away by the damp. He made new copies, filling in the gaps as intelligently as he could. This may explain why Aristotle is not the most fascinating philosopher in history. When Scylla captured Athens in 86, he appropriated the Pelican's library and transported it to Rome. There the Rhodian scholar Andronicus reordered and published the texts of Aristotle's works, an event almost as stimulating in the history of Roman thought as the rediscovery of Aristotle was to prove in the awakening of medieval philosophy. The adventures of this collection suggest the debt that literature owes to the Ptolemies for establishing and maintaining, as part of the museum, the famous Alexandrian library. Ptolemy I began it, Ptolemy II completed it, and added a smaller library in the suburban sanctuary of Serapis. By the end of Philadelphus's reign, the number of royals had reached 532,000, making probably 100,000 books in our sense of this word. For a time, the enlargement of this collection rivaled the strategy of power in the affections of the Egyptian kings. Ptolemy III ordered that every book brought to Alexandria should be deposited with the library, that copies should be made, the owner to receive the copy, the library to retain the original. The same autocrat asked Athens to lend him the manuscripts of Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides, and deposited $90,000 as security for their return. He kept the originals, sent back copies, and told the Athenians to keep his money as a forfeit. The ambition to possess old books became so widespread that men arose who specialized in dying and spoiling new manuscripts to sell them as antiquities to collectors of first editions. The library soon eclipsed the rest of the museum in importance and interest. The office of librarian was one of the highest in the king's gift and included the obligation of tutoring the crown prince. The names of these librarians have been preserved with variations in different manuscripts. The latest list gives, as the first six, Xenodotus of Ephesus, Apollonius of Rhodes, Eratosthenes of Cyrene, Apollonius of Alexandria, Aristophanes of Byzantium, and Aristarchus of Samothrace. Their diversity of origin suggests again the unity of Hellenistic culture. Quite as important as these was the poet and scholar Callimachus, who classified the collection in a catalogue running to 120 rolls. We picture a core of copyists, presumably slaves, making duplicates of precious originals, and a hive of scholars separating the materials into groups. Some of these men wrote histories of various departments of literature or science, others edited definitive editions of the masterpieces, others composed commentaries on these texts for the enlightenment of laity and posterity. Aristophanes of Byzantium effected a literary revolution by separating the clauses and sentences of the ancient writings with capitals and marks of punctuation. And it was he who invented the accents that so disturb us in reading Greek. Xenodotus began, Aristophanes advanced, Aristarchus completed the recension of the Iliad and the Odyssey, establishing the present text and illuminating its obscurities in learned scholia. By the end of the third century, the museum, the library, and their scholars had made Alexandria, in everything but philosophy, the intellectual capital of the Greek world. Doubtless other Hellenistic cities had libraries. Austrian archaeologists have exhumed the remains of an ornate municipal library at Ephesus, and we hear of a great library being consumed in the destruction of Carthage by Scipio. But the only one that evoked comparison with Alexandria's was that of Pergamum. The kings of this transient state looked with enlightened envy upon the cultural enterprises of the Ptolemies. In 196, Eumenes II established the Pergamene Library and brought to its halls some of the finest scholars of Greece. The collection grew rapidly when Antony presented it to Cleopatra to replace that part of the Alexandrian Library which was burned in the uprising against Caesar in 48 BC. It numbered some 200,000 rolls. Through this library and the attic taste of the Attalid kings, Pergamum became, towards the end of the Hellenistic period, the center of a purest school of Greek prose, which considered no word clean that had not come down from classic days. To the enthusiasm of these classicists, we owe the preservation of the chef d'oeuvre of Attic prose. It was above all an age of intellectuals and scholars. Writing became a profession instead of a devotion, and generated cliques and coteries whose appreciation of talent varied inversely as the square of its distance from themselves. Poets began to write for poets and became artificial. 
Scholars began to write for scholars and became dull. Thoughtful men felt that the creative inspiration of Greece was nearing exhaustion and that the most lasting service they could render was to collect, shelter, edit, and expound the literary achievements of a bolder time. They established the methods of textual and literary criticism in almost all its forms. They tried to sift out the best from the mass of existing manuscripts, and to guide the reading of the people, they made lists of best books, the four heroic poets, the nine historians, the ten lyric poets, the ten orators, etc. They wrote biographies of great writers and scientists. They gathered and saved the fragmentary data, which are now all that we know concerning these men. They composed outlines of history, literature, drama, science, and philosophy. Some of these shortcuts to knowledge helped to preserve, some replaced and unwittingly obliterated the original works that they summarized. Saddened by the degeneration of Attic Greek into the orientalized pidgin Greek of their time, Hellenistic scholars compiled dictionaries and grammars, and the Library of Alexandria, in the manner of the French Academy, issued edicts on the correct usage of the ancient tongue. Without their learned and patient ant industry, the wars, revolutions, and catastrophes of two thousand years would have destroyed even those precious minims, which have been transmitted to us as the shipwrecked legacy of Greece. 2. The Books of the Jews Through all the turmoil of the time, the Jews maintained their traditional love of scholarship and produced more than their share of the lasting literature of the age. To this period belong some of the finest portions of the Bible. Near the close of the third century, a Jewish poet, or poetess, composed the lovely Song of Songs. Here is all the artistry of Greek verse from Sappho to Theocritus, but with something undiscoverable in any Greek author of the time, an intensity of imagination, a depth of feeling, and an idealist devotion strong enough to welcome the body, as well as the soul, of love, and to turn the flesh itself into spirit. Partly in Jerusalem, mostly in Alexandria, partly in other cities of the eastern Mediterranean, Hellenistic Jews wrote, in Hebrew, Aramaic, or Greek, such masterpieces as Ecclesiastes, Daniel, part of Proverbs and Psalms, and most of the greater Apocrypha. They composed histories like Chronicles, novelettes like Esther and Judith, and idols of family life like the Book of Tobit. The Sopharim changed the Hebrew script from the Old Assyrian to the square Syrian style, which has remained to this day. Since most of the Jews in the Near East now spoke Aramaic rather than Hebrew, the scholars explained the scriptures in brief Aramaic targums, or interpretations. Schools were opened for the study of the Torah, or law, and the explanation of its moral code to growing youth. Such explanations, commentaries, and illustrations, handed down from teacher to pupil across the generations, supplied in a later age most of the material of the Talmud. By the close of the third century, the scholars of the Great Assembly had completed the editing of the older literature and had closed the canon of the Old Testament. It was their judgment that the age of the prophets was ended and that literal inspiration had ceased. The result was that many works of this epoch, full of wisdom and beauty, lost the chance of divine collaboration and fell into the unfortunate category of Apocrypha. The two books of Esdras may owe something of their literary excellence to King James's translators, but these can hardly be credited with the touching account of how Esdras asked the angel Uriel to explain why the wicked prosper, the good suffer, and Israel is in bondage, to which the angel answers in powerful similes and yet simple speech, that it is not given to the part to understand or judge the whole. The prologue of Ecclesiasticus describes it as a Greek translation, completed in 132, of discourses written in Hebrew two generations before by the translator's grandfather, Jesus, the son of Sirach. This Joshua ben Sirach was both a scholar and a man of affairs. After seeing something of the world through travel, he had settled down to make his home a school for students, and to them he delivered these essays on the wisdom of life. He denounces the rich Jews who have abandoned their faith to cut a better figure in the Gentile world. He warns youth against the courtesans who wait for it everywhere, and he offers the law as still the best guide amid the evils and pitfalls of the world. But he is no Puritan. Unlike the Hasidim, he has a good word to say for harmless pleasure, and he protests against the mystics who reject medicine on the ground that all maladies, having come from God, can be cured by God alone. The book is rich in epigrams, of which the most renowned brings together the rod and the child. The number of whippings laid to his account, said Renan, must be incalculable. It is a noble book, wiser and kinder than Ecclesiastes. In the twenty-fourth chapter of Ecclesiasticus, we are told that wisdom is the first product of God, created from the beginning of the world. Here and in the first chapter of Proverbs, 
are the earliest Hebrew forms of the doctrine of the Logos, wisdom as a demiurge, or intermediate creator delegated by God to design the world. This hypostasizing of wisdom as personified intelligence becomes a dominating idea of Jewish theology in the last centuries before Christ. Alongside of it runs increasingly the conception of personal immortality. In the book of Enoch, written apparently by several authors in Palestine between 170 and 66 B.C., the hope of heaven has become a vital need. The success of wicked power and the misfortunes of a pious and loyal people could no longer be born unless that hope might be entertained. Without it, life and history seemed to be the work of Satan rather than of God. A Messiah will come who will establish the kingdom of heaven on earth and will reward the virtuous with everlasting happiness after death. In the book of Daniel, the whole terror of the age of Antiochus IV finds a voice. About 166, when the faithful had been persecuted to the death for their beliefs, and ever larger enemies were advancing upon the Maccabean band, one of the Hasidim probably undertook to rekindle the courage of the people by describing the sufferings and prophecies of Daniel in the days of Nebuchadrezzar in Babylon. Copies of the book passed secretly among the Jews. It was given out as the work of a prophet who had lived 370 years before, had borne greater trials than any Jew under Antiochus, had emerged victorious, and had predicted a like triumph for his race. And even if the virtuous and faithful found indifferent fortune here, their reward would come at the last judgment, when the Lord would welcome them into a heaven of unending happiness and plunge their persecutors into everlasting hell. All in all, the extant Jewish writings of this period may be described as a mystic or imaginative literature of instruction, edification, and consolation. To the Jews of earlier ages, life itself had been enough, and religion was not a flight from the world, but a dramatization of morals by, by the poetry of faith. A powerful God, ruling and seeing all things, would reward virtue and punish vice in this existence on earth. The captivity had shaken this belief. The restoration of the temple had renewed it. It broke down under the bludgeoning of Antiochus. Pessimism now had a clear field, and in the writings of the Greeks, the Jews found the most eloquent exposures of the injustices and tragedies of life. Meanwhile, Jewish contact with Persian ideas of heaven and hell, of a struggle between good and evil, and the final triumph of good, offered an escape from the philosophy of despair, and perhaps the ideas of immortality that had come down from Egypt to Alexandria, and those that had animated the mysteries of Greece, cooperated to inspire in the Jews of the Greek and Roman periods that consoling hope which bore them up through all the vicissitudes of their temple and their state. From these Jews and from the Egyptians, Persians, and Greeks, the idea of eternal reward and punishment would flow down into a new and stronger faith and help it to win a disintegrating world. 3. Menander Like the other arts, the drama enjoyed in this age its greatest quantitative prosperity. Every city, almost every third-rate town, had its theater. The actors, better organized than ever, were in great demand, enjoyed high fees, and lived with characteristic superiority to the morals of their time. Dramatists continued to turn out tragedies, but whether by accident or good taste, tradition has covered them with oblivion's balm. The mood of Hellenistic Athens, like ours today, preferred the light-hearted, light-headed, sentimental, happy-ending stories of the new comedy. Of this, too, only fragments remain, but we have some discouraging samples of it in the pilferings of Plautus and Terence, who composed their plays by translating and adapting Hellenistic comedies. The high concerns of state and soul that aroused Aristophanes are in the new comedy put aside as too perilous for the literary neck. Usually the theme is domestic or private, and traces the devious roads by which women are led to generosity, and men nevertheless to matrimony. Love enters upon its triumphant career as master of the boards. A thousand damsels in distress cross the stage, but achieve honor and wedlock in the end. The old phallic dress is abandoned, and the old phallic bawdiness, but the story circles narrowly about the virginity of the leading lady, and virtue plays as small a role in it as in our daily press. Since the actors wore masks and the number of masks was limited, the comic dramatist wove his plots of intrigue and mistaken identity around a few stock characters whom the audience was always delighted to recognize. The cruel father, the benevolent old man, the prodigal son, the heiress mistaken for a poor girl, the bragging soldier, the clever slave, the flatterer, the parasite, the physician, the priest, the philosopher, the cook, the courtesan, the procuress, and the pimp. The masters of this comedy of manners in third-century Athens were Philemon and Menander. Of Philemon, hardly anything survives except the echo of his renown. The Athenians liked him better than Menander and gave him more prizes, but Philemon had raised to high excellence the art of organizing a claque. 
Posterity, being ignored in the subsidy, reversed the judgment and gave the crown to Menander's bones. This congreve of Athens was a nephew of the fertile dramatist Alexis of Thurii, the pupil of Theophrastus, and the friend of Epicurus. From them he learned the secrets of drama, philosophy, and tranquility. He almost realized Aristotle's ideal. He was handsome and rich, contemplated life with serenity and understanding, and took his pleasures like a gentleman. He was an inconstant lover, content to repay Glycera's devotion by touching her name with immortality. When Ptolemy I invited him to Alexandria, he sent Philemon in his stead, saying, Philemon has no Glycera. Glycera, who had suffered much, rejoiced at having triumphed over a king. Thereafter, we are assured, he lived faithfully with her until, at the age of fifty-two, he died of a cramp while swimming at the Piraeus. His first play, as if announcing a new epoch, appeared in the year that followed Alexander's death. Thereafter, he wrote one hundred and four comedies, eight of which won the first prize. Some four thousand lines remain, all in brief fragments, except for a papyrus discovered in Egypt in 1905. This contains half of the Epitropontes, or the Arbitrants, and has lowered Menander's reputation. We shall waste our reproaches if we complain that the themes of these plays are as monotonous as those of Greek sculpture, architecture, and pottery. We must remind ourselves that the Greeks judged a work not by the story it told, which is a child's criterion, but by the manner of its telling. What the Greek mind relished in Menander was the neat polish of his style, the philosophy concentrated in his wit, and so realistic a portrayal of common scenes that Aristophanes of Byzantium asked, O Menander, O life! Which of you imitated the other? In a world that had fallen forfeit to soldiers, nothing remained in Menander's view but to contemplate human affairs as a spectator indulgent but uninvolved. He notes the vanities and vacillations of woman, but concedes that the average wife is a blessing. The action of the arbitrants turns in part upon a rejection of the double standard, and of course one play is about the virtuous prostitute who, like Dumas' Lady of the Camellias, refuses the man whom she loves in order to get him respectably married to a profitable wife. Lines that are now proverbs appear in the fragments, like evil communications corrupt good manners, quoted by St. Paul, and conscience makes cowards of the bravest men. Some credit Menander with the original of Terence's famous line, Homo sum, humani nil ame alienum futo. I am a man and consider nothing human to be alien to me. Occasionally we come upon jewels of insight, as in everything that dies dies by its own corruption, all that injures is within or in these typical verses, prophetic of Menander's early death. Whom the gods love die young, that man is blessed who, having viewed at ease this solemn show of sun, stars, ocean, fire, doth quickly go back to his home with calm, uninjured breast. Be life short or long, tis manifest, thou ne'er wilt see things goodlier, Parmeno, than these. Then take thy sojourn here as though thou wert some playgoer or wedding guest. The sooner sped, the safelier to thy rest. Well furnished, foe to none, with strength at need, shalt thou return. While he who tarries late faints on the road outworn, with age oppressed, harassed by foes whom life's dull tumults breed. Thus ill dies he for whom death long doth wait. 4. Theocritus When Philemon died in 262, Greek comedy, and in large measure Athenian literature, died with him. The theatre flourished, but it produced no masterpieces that time or scholarship thought fit to preserve, and the repetition of old comedies, chiefly those of Menander and Philemon, more and more crowded out original productions. As the third century ended, the spirit of the gay society that had generated the new comedy died away, and was replaced in Athens by the serious mood of the philosophical schools. Other cities, Alexandria in particular, tried to transplant the dramatic art, but failed. The great library and the scholars whom it had attracted set the tone of Alexandrian literature. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now.